السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم شيخ نبيل سيد حسن thank you so much uh, for being on this podcast um, we are continuing to look at the idea of reform in this series and in reforming the uh, the heart and the spirit and the mind there is of course reforming the body because among the compositions which form the human being there is jism there is the body and among the various things we can learn from Abba Abdullah we're very interested in self-development how do I grow as a person how do I improve myself as a human being and take an inspiration from Imam al-Hussein some motivation to get better and, and, and to improve myself this discussion is primarily focused on that physical side of our nature right um and how we can reform this part of us in the context of all of our other goals and ambitions, our bodies, our form, our, our life in this dunya. Um, before we go all into those discussions, we should again look at the idea of what reform is, because Imam Hussein does say clearly that he's setting out to reform the Ummah of his grandfather, but it's not clear how he's using that word of reform. So to set kind of us in motion, I'll start with, uh, with you, Sheikh Nabil, um, to ask you, when we use the word reform, when Abba Abdullah uses the word reform, what's a good way of understanding that word for us? Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The reformation that Sayyidu Shahada seeks to achieve uh, is the one where he's saying, Islafi ummati jaddi, in the ummah of my grandfather. What is that reformation? One needs to look at the other uh, things that Say the Shahada, other letters or sayings that Say the Shahada says around that time. So, for example, one of the letters that he sends to the people of Basra, uh, and uh, with his um, companion or his gov- uh, messenger Sulaiman, in that letter uh, he sends it to Munzar ibn Jarud, and in that he says that uh, addressing him explains the situation, why it needs reforming. Says that, know that the sunnah of the prophet has been killed and bid'ah, innovation has become rife within society. So this is one of those reasons why Sayyidu Shahada goes out for reform. You know, what is the need of that reform? Because the sunnah of the prophet has been left. And that sunnah doesn't just relate to one's spiritual growth or one's mental growth, but it also ha- is in reference to one's physical growth as well. Because we have many, many things in the Sunnah of the Prophet that address issues of uh, the body as well. So how is it that Sayyid al-Shuhada is going to achieve it? He himself again explains in that same letter that he leaves with Muhammad Hanafiya, uh, he says that I, how I'm going out for Islafi Ummati Jaddi, I'm going out in order because I'm seeking to enjoin good, forbid the evil. How are you going to do that, Sayyidu Shuhada? By walking on the path of my grandfather and my father Ali. It's as simple as that, that I'm going to walk this path. Now, when I walk this path, that means that I'm doing a reformation of not just the spirit, not just the mind, but also the body. Hassan, so thank you for, for bringing in the idea of the body in that idea of reform so that we know why, why it's important and why it's part of that journey. So Hassan, same question to you. When, when you look at the word reform and when you kind of you think of that period of time and us right now, how do you use that word for it to have practical use for us today? So personally, I know that the normal word we use to you know, translate and explain islah is reform. Just because of all the, you know, modern contemporary connotations, even among some speakers using the word reform to say that we're updating or changing the, you know, the original sirah and sunnah of Rasulullah and the Ahlul Bayt, I personally don't, you know, I've, I've tried to shy away from that word. And I prefer, sometimes people would use like rectify or revitalize or, you know, something like that. I mean, you can open up a source and figure out which one you want to use. But this idea of, taking it back, right? Because if you look at islah, usually ulama will say that it stands in opposition to ifsad, meaning to cause fasad. And fasad, if you look at that, is chaos, right? It's anarchy, it's disorder. Whereas 
Islah then is to try to create sulh. Sulh, again, normally most of us hear and think about the various sulh, meaning a treaty. But sulh stands opposite of fasad, meaning that it's whereas in fasad, you have chaos, anarchy, disorder, sulh, and therefore islah is trying to bring about now a harmony, trying to bring about order and balance or the natural equilibrium, the natural state of things, things as God has intended them to, to be. And this is exactly what, as Sheikh Nabil was saying, this is what Imam Hussein alayhi salam with his family, with his companions, that's what they're rising to do is that they see that that balance, that order, that equilibrium that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had established, they had moved slowly. I mean, we, can, we don't have to say slowly. Some of them came and you know made some extreme changes, but it started to go farther and farther and farther. And at every single point, let's say, you know, at Saqifa, where things, you know, immediately took a turn for the worse. And then started to get worse and worse with every single, we'll call it regime or administration, whatever word you want to use. There was still some semblance of Islam there. So it wasn't complete anarchy and disorder. Yeah, they threw things out of balance, but it wasn't that bad. Then you would, when you get to Muawiyah and then finally to Yazid, then you see that things are completely out of order. Completely, you know, there's no equilibrium anymore. And this is why it's so important for Imam Hussein to say, to teach the Muslim Ummah that you have, you know, with these little bits of moving away from the original Sirah and Sunnah of Rasulullah, this is where you are right now. You have allowed for a person like Yazid to come into power. You've allowed for his lackeys to take power. You have allowed yourselves to completely lose your, your Islamic uh, and Muslim identity. So in that sense, reforming or revitalizing or, uh, you know, going back to that uh, original, the original form and the original perfect message that Rasulullah had br brought, as Sheikh Nabi again was talking about, it's done on various dimensions. Normally, when we're talking in Muharram, people either think of, you know, I think they only focus on a few specific dimensions. So one, I think, is obviously going to be, let's say, very political. I think obviously political ones, meaning get rid of the Umayyads or Yazid specifically. Some will talk about more spiritual, akhlaqi things, which is there as well. Nowadays, especially because of all the different trends that exist, people will talk about, you know, mental health, especially. Uh, following all those trends, if we don't understand that the physical is a huge part of this, a huge part and parcel of this, then I think we're missing the whole greater message of Islam that it's a complete and total message. As you know, we as say as almost a cliche that Islam is, you know, a perfect total way of life, right? That's what it is. Well, if that's the case, we are dealing in the physical dunya right now. We need specific instructions for that dunya. And inshallah, as I'm sure as we'll open up later on, these physical dimensions also had been, had been moved away from. From things as Sheikh Nabi was alluding to, the halal and haram specifically, which is why the Amr bin Ma'aluf and Nahi Anil Mulkar need to be done. But even this idea of creating this harmony, this sulh, and performing islah to your own body, meaning going back to the original form that our bodies are designed to do, meaning we are created for ibadah, to turn back towards Allah. It's a vehicle, that's all it is. And if our bodies are used for something other than that, then you see the consequences. And to, again, as we see, the consequences of that could be that you stand opposing the grandson of Rasulullah on the day of Ashur. Like, let's follow it then. Let's follow that strand of going back to the origin. If, especially if we like the idea that reform means going back to when things are at an equilibrium or things how they're designed to be. And anything from then until now is facade. It, it's corruption. It's it's the distortion of what was in its natural state. So let's follow that for ourselves as human beings, right? We have an original form, which was for worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal, maybe a state of innocence or a state which was away from corruption we may have done from our own hands. And in that perfect form, our original form, the body is an important part of that. Um, what does it look like? What is the original form of the human being in worshipping Allah? What are we trying to go back to? In reforming ourselves, Sheikh Nabil, what is the thing we are seeking in reformation with regards to our body and, and ourselves? Um, if you see, if you say that, you know, are we when we're seeking something, it's not necessary that you know there's a riwayat they say, listen, your biceps need to be this big, and you know you've got to have a six pack, and you know the, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, we don't have narrations like that, but it's the narrations that talk about exerting physical, uh, exerting your body to physical strain, uh, to do work that, you know, puts your body under physical strain. So 
there are multiple narrations that talk about different things um, that are related to the body, but not necessarily that provide an archetype of what the ideal body is like. Um, and so, you know, it's very difficult to say, okay, what should everyone look like? Because like the discussion is not just the, the outward superficial uh, appearance of the body, because we know right now, even, you know, in the World Cup, someone that is, uh, oh, in the Euro, sorry, someone who is very, very healthy, fit, all of a sudden has cardiac arrest on the pitch. Zahir, and when you look at that person, you'd be like, the peak of physical uh, health, you know, because you've seen this person, they're slim, whatever, they're training all the time, but yet all of a sudden, you know, they have this cardiac arrest. So there's no I, physical ideal. There are just recommendations that we have in regards to our body. And I'm sure, you know, uh, Sayyid will be able to add more to that. Edna, can you add more to that? Is that that's the signal, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. So, yeah, as Sheikh Nabil was saying, right, just uh, since he told me to piggyback off him, I'll piggyback off of him in that sense. So, yeah, there's no ideal single perfect form for everybody in that sense, right? We've all been created differently. We all have different souls, different identities in that sense. Yes, everything needs to be tohidi in its essence, and that's how it is. At the same time, it'll all depend on the sort of paradigm and approach that we use, right? Very simply, like in terms of what kind of religious epistemology we want to use. Specifically, I mean, do you want to look at it, a, a strict analysis of the Quran, uh, you know, the ayat and the ahadith to try to, you know, understand what does it mean to, you know, what is, again, as Sheikh Nabil was alluding to, this pure physical or the best physical form that we can have? Do we want to take a, an empirical approach and then kind of force feed that into the Islamic sciences, which I know some, you know, uh, nowadays like to do that. I'm, I'm not a big fan of that, but I can understand that that's that's an approach people t will take, especially, you know, um, again, the, I meant to mention mental health because that's what's used nowadays by many speakers as well. well they'll take a purely, you know, Western, uh, whether it's a Jungian approach or otherwise, and then kind of figure out how they can fit it into Islam, right? Without saying that Islam itself can offer its own and has its own thing to say. Okay. So sometimes people will do that for the physical as well. And then, there are all those who are into, again, more of the metaphysical sciences. So they'll take a philosophical or an Arifani approach. And when you do that, then it becomes a bit, I don't want to say clear, because that's going to be a bias, obviously, from, uh, from the perspective of those who prefer those sciences, or see them as the higher sciences compared to the lower sciences. But it, in a sense, I think it offers more to explain. And I'll, let me explain why that's the case. So a simple, a simple kind of version, a simplified version of the paradigm that somebody could use metaphysically in terms of understanding the physical is that look yes we are pure immaterial beings that's that is who we really are uh, as that pure essence that we have descends lower and lower through the various realms we end up here on the physical plane every single plane that we are requires some sort of vehicle in barzakh we have this quote-unquote barzakhi or mithali body as they call it right over here we've got our physical body all of this is for us to perform certain duties and tasks that that's all that's required now I can't give the fancy sports analogies that Sheikh Nabil gives because I've been out of the sports scenes for a long time, but at least we can give maybe, I can give car analogies or, or at least vehicular analogies. So if let's say, I mean, a lot of us maybe didn't have a say in the first car that we got. Uh, Alhamdulillah, my father, Marhum, he gave me, uh, I mean, I had to save up basically, but I had the choice of buying whatever, what I wanted because I saved up. So my first was a, a Subaru uh, Impreza WRX. It was back in 2002, first time that they, they had imported the WRX to the US. So I was excited. I mean, it's a boxer, you know, four engine, uh, four cylinder, horizontally opposed, uh, tur factory turbocharged. I mean, top mount. Sorry, I'm going to, we're going, I'm going on a tangent. Show here, how but. much he knows. Like he, he's. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that car, as everybody knows, requires a, sp a specific type of gas or for you guys, petrol, right? Uh, nowadays, with hybrid cars, it's something different. With electric cars, it's something different. If you have a car, <clears throat> a pickup truck or a van or whatever, you, I think you get the analogy. It's very simple. The, the vehicle that you are given or provided with is going to require different types of maintenance. It's very obvious. All we have over here, and that can come down to your, uh, how controversial this will be nowadays, I don't know, but your biological sex, meaning your gender. That, these are two different vehicles that our soul, which is genderless, has been given. We are now put in this vehicle and we are 
we are required, we are obligated to treat it a certain way. Uh, and again, these things are alluded to in the hadith as well. Our souls are basically just these various combinations of God's names, right? To kind of put it simply. When it shows up in the physical, our job is to say, okay, we've got all these different names of God that we are, our you know, spiritual constitution, our spiritual disposition, uh, temperament, whatever word you want to use, right? Our, our spiritual personality type. That now is attached to this physical body. These things have this, you know, uh, what's the word I want to use, right? It's this kind of cyclical re relationship. You know, sometimes when we talk about the physical and spiritual, we only talk about it from one way, right? We say, oh yeah, we do something physical, it'll affect the spiritual. Sometimes it's both ways, right? So yeah, I can have something, even as something as simple as a certain type of food or a lack of exercise uh, or too much exercise or whatever extreme it happens to be. And that's going to have an effect on the soul or the spirit. Likewise, our soul or spirit is going to require a specific type of physical regimen as well. Uh, I mean, I'll give you the example that one of my own teachers gave. So many of you know at this point, right, that I was, I have been doing keto, although I'm on a pause now, but I've been doing it for four or five years. And usually the main criticism that I would get from people is that, oh, the prophet never did that. The Ahlul Bayt never did keto. I was like, yeah, obviously they didn't do keto. At the same time, the food that they had back then was actually re real food. Uh, maybe for you people in, in Europe, it's a bit different, but over here in America, what we have on our shelves, basically, you can barely call that food. It's mostly chemicals and trash, things that are taking your body out of that equilibrium and that balance that we, you and I need in order to perform our ibadah properly. So, uh, so the reason I mentioned food specifically is because, again, as my teacher had mentioned that, look, your spiritual constitution, if it works for you, meaning it's helping you towards your ibadah, then keto seems to be fine for you. Use it as long as it lasts. It's just, you know, again, it's a tool that you're using on your, in your tool belt. For other people, it might be different. Although generally, yeah, there are some practices that I think every single Muslim, especially brown people, especially Desi people, that we have to start cutting out, right? It's Muharram. It's funny that our Muharram eating practices sometimes are no different than our Iftar Ramadan practices, right? The same types of unhealthy foods, uh, the same overeating practices, you know, most of us, alhamdulillah, we're doing well financially, but we just take all this extra and just, you know, shove it down our throats. And this is going to have an effect on us. And uh, I'm going to tie it to Muharram now, and then uh, I'm going to stop talking. We have, right, that famous, uh, as, record, as, rec as is recorded, right, that uh, Imam Hussein, alayhi salam, when he's addressing these people who are, you know, standing against him, he's trying to address them in these khutbas and telling them that, you know, you know don't you recognize who I am and all this stuff. In the middle of one of these khutbas, uh, after he sees that clearly they're not listening to what he's saying, then he says these famous lines, right? فَقَدْ مُلِئَتْ بُتُونَكُمْ مِنَ الْحَرَامِ That your insides have been filled with haram. عَلَى قُلُوبِكُمْ That this has caused a seal and a stamp on your hearts now. That he's literally linking the physical to the spiritual. Even if you want to take it at a surface level, that because they ate haram things or their insides were filled with haram, again, there's higher level explanations as well, but let's suffice with that for now because they were eating haram things or filling themselves with haram, then the effect is that, right? Their, their hearts have been sealed and stamped. So they can't listen to haq anymore. They can't listen to the truth. Because people ask like, look, these are, these are Muslims, people who are hafad of Quran. Uh, by many accounts, they say, Urad ibn Saad was a hafad of the Quran. People on the other side, you know, these uh, people of Kufa and Basra, these who had, who had come to fight against Imam Hussein, they, they were practitioners of Islam. It's not like they were non-Muslims, they were Muslims and they practiced but something had stopped them from recognizing that they were taking Islam out of balance. And they were literally fighting against the person who was the only balancing figure of Islam, meaning Imam Hussein alayhi salam. But I think I've been talking too much, so let me stop here. That narration is so important. It's so important to show that this discussion we're having was relevant even then, that the physical is linked to the immaterial. And I think what you've helped to do is put the priority right. We have a goal we're going towards, right? And the body and this world acts as a vehicle or a tool or an implement to get there. And that means that if my goal is Allah Azza wa Jal, I deserve to adjust my daily living with that goal in mind. And many people might be thinking that religion is not structured in this way where it's just a thing you do day to day, like it's just for the sake of getting one day at a time. But in truth, it's our origin. By phrasing it like this, it means that whatever we do to the body, it must be linked towards God somehow. It must be linked towards improving our relation to Allah or, or these kind of things. But like you mentioned, there are so many ways in which the way we treat our body stops us from doing ibadah to Allah. So that's like one example. But there's so many. Sheikh Nabil, have you seen examples where we're not regarding our, our bodies or ourselves with God in mind? Like we're, that's not our aim. You know, where do we see this in our community? Because I see so many examples of it. 
Um, obviously, the one of them being food. Um, you know, like Sayed said, that there's a massive, when you look at the narrations regarding food, you know, in science, you have two types of relationship. You have a correlational relationship and you have a causal relationship. Uh, a correlational one is you do A and maybe B and C and D happen. Uh, we're not sure, but, you know, these three were viewed. And then there's a causal relationship where you do A and B happens. Uh, food and spirituality is a causal relationship. Like the amount you eat, what you eat, when you eat. And, you know, this um, of Sayyid al-Shahada in Karbala saying to these individuals, your stomachs are filled with haram. And it's, uh, you know, with with bits of haram. They were Muslims. They were eating halal. They were, they're probably eating more halal and more zabiha and more tayyib food than we were. But yet, why is it that that same halal food that they were eating, probably sacrificing it themselves, fulfilling all the requirements of sharia, turned them against the hujjah of Allah? It's because where the money was coming from, initially, for them to buy all of this. You know, there's, there's that link, and now they're buying it, even though the food, zahiran, is halal, but the money they've used is haram, because they're using, they're getting money off Yazid, or they've been for years uh, on the payroll of Muawiyah, and, you know, and it's, and it has this massive uh, effect on an individual. You know, the person I mentioned before, Munzad ibn Jarud, he is with, say, uh, Amir al muminin in Jemal, fighting against Muawiyah. But when Imam Hussein alayhi salam sent Sulaiman to him in Basra, he grabs hold of him by the hand and he takes him to Ibn Ziyad. And Ibn Ziyad, his father Ziyad, was one of the governors of Amir al Mu'mineen before he turns, you know, uh, uh, bad. You know, you see, like, there are times when people are good, but then there, something happens that they will then turn around and be willing to kill the Hajjah of Allah. Yeah, maybe they were always, uh, you know, had that. Uh, in their heart but at the same time you know um, they were they were individuals that Zahiran were good so you have all these people these Kufans that have written to Imam Hussain 30,000 Kufans most of them are Kufans that have come out to kill Imam Hussain you know in Karbala the Shamis they didn't know they were just like oh Hussain who we, we heard of an Ali and whatever but the Kufans knew but yet because of that Haram in their stomachs. So there's the link between food as well. Um, there are other, when you look at uh, sort of narrations of the uh, muttaqin or the true Shias, you have people, um, you know, where the Imam is looking, they say, you know, they're following the Imam. The imam says, Who are you? He says, Oh, we are your Shias. So you don't look like my Shias. So it's because our Shias, their lips are dry through constant dhikr. Their skin is pale because of their, you know, uh, constant fear. Their eyes are like this. They're like, they're, you know, their noses are like this. All of this sort of stuff because as a result of their physical ibadat. Um, and so physical being and the, and the importance that we place because this body, like Sayyid said, the the body is the vehicle the driving force is the soul and you know many times there can be a frail body but yet has the strength of you know a hundred men it's displayed with uh, Amir al mumini you know physical strength and spiritual strength are two different things i can go to the gym and uh, bench press 100 kgs all day long but ask me to sit straight for the akumail and all of a sudden, now oh, my back's hurting, I need a wall to rest on. Yeah, <laughs> Where, where's all my physicality gone? That all those core muscles I've been working on, now that core can't even sit me up straight to do dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, now I need to stretch out my legs and now I need to, you know, stretch, you know, have a, you know, a wall to lean against. So there's so much that we, you know, I've probably totally gone off from what you'd asked me uh, initially. Uh, but, you know, there is this thing that we somehow have this cognitive dissonance when it comes to uh, physical being and spiritual being, whereas they're interlinked. You cannot exist uh, without focusing on the other. Like, you cannot exist by exist, I mean, like, live a goodly life, live a, 
a proper existence without focusing on the physical and the spiritual. Like Sid Hassan, like you mentioned earlier, there's an equilibrium in these things where you are focusing on your body and your, your soul in, alongside one another where they are part of the same effort, which is reaching Allah as well. But those narrations that Sheikh Nabil mentioned and others, they represent a very specific form of the body. You know, the Mu'manin, the Muttaqin, for example, they are thin. Um, they spend their nights in worship. Where is, there's some hadith in, in Hajj al where the Imam is speaking about the prophets. He's like, Prophet Musa, you know, you could see the food inside his belly. He was so thin. And Nabi Isa, his body was, was like lying on like rocks in the streets and things like this. And that makes a form of the body, which some people say is the true form or the ideal form for the worship of, of Allah. But many people listening will be thinking, well, that's not really my lifestyle. That's not what I'm even trying for. And that seems so abstract. Like, is that even a thing worth attaining? So my question to you is, how do we fit those narrations into our view of our own bodies? Yeah, that's, no, that's a very important question. So I'm glad you raised it. So, you know, when it comes to these types of ideals, we usually end up, uh, you know, uh, the community members end up doing this, right? We'll find specific sets of narrations of like the ideal of the Ahlul Bayt or the prophets. We say, ah, we're gonna, all going to go and shoot for that. But then there's certain other ones where like, ah, maybe those things, you know, maybe that's not for us because they're only Ma'asameen. We don't have to worry about those, right? What's interesting here is, yeah, we clearly have all these narrations about the Anbiya, um, and certain members of the Ahlul Bayt. And I think that's, that's the key here too. Yeah, you do have those types of things where basically they're skinny, they're emaciated, they're hungry constantly. But at the same time, uh, I think most of us know if we've been you know, listening to lectures for, for years is that there's clearly different examples among the Ahlul Bayt as well, right? So they have the famous example of Imam Ali alayhi salam. You know, uh, first, we're going back to what Sheikh Nabil was saying. He... If we are imagining this, you know, kind of skinny, frail person who's just, you know, eating dry bread and maybe some honey and yogurt and salt, you know, things like that. Okay, well, this is the person ripped off the door of Khaybar as well and used as a shield. So keep that in mind. How is this stuff possible, right? Physical fitness and the idea of how it's supposed to be used given your, your circumstances. So now... Given that in mind, when Imam Ali alayhi salam is now the Khalifa, we, as most of us know, that Imam Hassan alayhi salam, he pretty much acted as a, what's the best word to use? I guess like ambassador or something like that. Meaning they would say that, of course, Imam Ali was leaving, living a simple life, right? So, you know, uh, what we would imagine the kind of ideal role model uh, that, as you, uh, boss, you were mentioning, right? Is, you know, skinny, don't have much food, dry lips, all that stuff. But then again, you look at what's being served and what's happening at Imam Hassan's house, alayhi salam. Nice house, nice spread, good amount of food, right? Those same styles of narrations about Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, alayhi salam, and many of the other Ahlul Bayt, you don't have that. You don't see that they're like, you know, this, this frail, skinny. In fact, some of them go the complete opposite way. They say that, you know, the Imams had, you know, what we would call like, you know, the biryani bellies, they had pot bellies. And it's like, seems very strange. You see narrations where some of the Imams would be sitting at the, you know, the the stakhan, the sufra, or the tablecloth, whatever, but sitting to eat, and there'd be a whole, you know, like, pile or dish of meat and they would just be eating meat constantly like before i'm talking about the keto diet this looks like they're eating the carnivore diet they're just eating nothing but meat like what's going on over here so the way that the physical is going to be used the physical body i don't know if it's fair to say that yes that skinny you know very frail lack of energy as some of us might have in our mind i don't think that that is the ideal in every single circumstance yeah there might be somewhere that makes that that makes sense and i think you and I can probably think of a few different examples, right? When you, we, especially us, you know, all of us from our backgrounds, when you see certain types of even speakers and scholars, mulanas, ulama, and you see them with a certain type of body, right? We'll put it that way, right? I'm going like this for a reason. When you see that, and there's some people who are eating, listening and uh, they cannot see because they're listening on Spotify, but they can just imagine oh, okay. the hand motions of Sayyid Hassan. <laughs> uh, you know, those who are, alhamdulillah, they are. They're gifted in, in certain areas, right? They're, they're, they're just bigger, all right? Well, I'll put it simply, right? I'll put that they're obese as well. Uh, and when they're invited to the centers, they're sitting down, there's, you know, of course, they have a special table, they have a special section, they have, you know, not just a normal type of food, they get, they're getting more food and special food, and all this stuff is happening. And all these other mu'mineen, Maybe some are like, okay, it's good to do ihtiram of ulama and things like that, people who are doing, who are the khuddam and servants of the Ahlul Bayt. Okay, look, that's a separate discussion. But this speaker or alim or Molana or Zakir, whoever they are, 
they're sitting down, they're doing this. There's other mu'minin and mu'minat who are watching and looking at this, like, what is this elite sort of treatment that's being done over here? And why is this person eating so much that, I mean, when I was a kid growing up, I used to see Mulanas burping on the member because they'd be <laughs> overeating so much. This is how they, I'm like, this is a terrible thing to see. Maybe in certain cultures, they don't have that same sort of attachment or connection between hygiene and this. But many of us born and raised, I think in the West, we do have that. Like, you know, somebody sitting there, you know, they're burping. It's just, you know, a, a gross demeanor to put it that way. So given that person's circumstance, that speaker, that item, whatever, look, eating like this doesn't really make sense. Maybe they need to be living a different lifestyle. Now, I'll give you my own personal thing, because obviously, I, I'm obviously on the skinnier side. When I go out and eat, it's funny. Let's say I'm invited somewhere and I eat, you know, this is not some like fake humility thing. I just don't, I just can't eat much because I'm skinny, right? I just, that's just how my metabolism, my body works. I don't eat much. But when I do that, what happens with all these kind hearted, you know, aunties and whatever is they start to say, well, um, you know, you need to eat more. You need to do this. You need to do that. I'm like, look, do you want me to eat like more? How are we or do you want me to eat like Imam Ali? You have to pick. And then they stop right there. Like, cause I have to be a bit forceful sometimes because I have to understand my own spirituality. If I eat a certain way or a certain, uh, a certain amount or certain types of food, it's going to affect me, whether we're talking about ma macro or micronutrients, right? It's going to ha have an effect on me. I should be self-aware, self-conscious enough. Most of us aren't, but I should be, or should be striving for that to figure out what, what kind of effect is that having on me in my just normal life? Maybe even my level of anger, my level of patience. Again, level of ibadah is like a typical thing we go to, but Many people don't make that link. Yeah, mental health experts are finally understanding that, yeah, there's a huge link to the, these foods which are causing us depression and stress and anxiety, which if all that's happening in our lives, that's going to affect our, our spirituality clearly, right? Uh, and, you know, where all these people are saying, you know, recite more Quran, recite more Dua. Some people are saying go for CBT and therapy or take pills. Look, all that stuff is there. But, you know, the main sort of pill that's there is, is your food. Like you could be, you know, abusing yourself in that sense as well. Okay, let me go back to the original question. So, it doesn't seem like there's, if we're trying to reconcile all of these things, some of the Ahlul Bayt, they wouldn't be what we call these, you know, like Mr. Universe or things, something like that. They don't have these like jacked built bodies. At the same time, is it always going to be the case that even the Ahlul Bayt are the standard of body types? Because now we're talking about Muharram, we're talking about Ashura, we're talking about Karbala. The people that are fighting there are all different types. Yes. For men, I think when we're talking about the masculine sort of archetype, we jump to Hadith Abbas very clearly. This is what we, you know, we say, man, this is a manly man, right? In that sense. I know, again, something nowadays, people talk about toxic masculinity and all this. Islam has its own idea of futuwa. What does it really mean to be a man? And we're clearly seeing Abbas being this. In the physical prowess that he has, in the bravery that's, you know, that's explained, but also the fact that through his conquering of his own ego and nafs, uh, again, it's not, it's not the topic, but just to, uh, you know, to, sh to kind of explain what I mean. He, as we all know, was built, you know, he was created specifically to protect and fight for Imam Hussein, right? That, that's what he was trained for by Umm al That's what he's made for. On Karbala, according to, you know, many historians, he's being specifically told by Imam Hussein, look, that sort of bravado, that bravery, that fighting that you have, you have to turn it down a little bit. You can't actually can't go on. You can't go full out. When he's you know allowed to go out for water again some say that no he wasn't allowed to go with the sword only with the spear or from the back of the spear just the you know the blunt wooden side maybe we have various narrations on this so some the way they'll explain it is that look imagine being thought to have a specific purpose and goal in your mind right to like i'm this big person i have to go and do something big and physical now what he could have done on the battlefield he was almost prevented from doing so which means that he had conquered himself enough that that physical that he had created which could have been used in that instance wasn't and in fact, he only used it for in the service of his imam. And that's it. When his imam said, you can go out and get water, he went. When he, his imam ordered him to do this with the sword, he did. When his imam said, do this instead, he, you know, he adjusted it. So his physical vehicle was at the complete discretion of his imam, his mawla, his hujjah, not anything and not himself. Although for his whole life, he had been trained one way. The minute his imam gives a different order, he changes. So for a lot of us, again, who let's say maybe exercising as is recommended, we go to the gym, we are assuming that our physical body may be put to the service of the imam. Yeah, maybe that's the case. Yeah, that might happen. We'll have to see, inshallah, if we're able to put our services for the imam. Inshallah, may Allah grant us all of that tawfiq. At the same time, we're all living in local communities as well. What do, what do our local ulama need from us? I mean, I've seen some cases where people need to, you know, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm helping, you know, I'm, I'm in the middle of moving right now. Just getting different what we need to come help move with some things. You can tell who's physically fit and who's, who's not, right? Who... 
uh, myself, like, you know, I'm, I move a few boxes and I'm like tired, like, hold on, I need some, I need to replenish my electrolytes, you know, <laughs> I'm like, I'm losing myself here. At the same time, so we talked about Abbas. Now go to the other side, you see people like Habib ibn Muzahir, who he says that, you know, yeah, Hussein, when I see you, I feel like I'm a youth again. Somebody who in his youthful age was on the battlefield, was fighting constantly. But even at his age, right? I, I forgot the, the ages that they mentioned, maybe like 80, 90 plus, something like that. He was probably the oldest person on the battlefield. Yet he is still fighting better than half of those, you know, people that were a quarter of his age. Why? Because that he had built his physical overtime, but his spiritual had always taken precedence. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tie all these things together. Do we have to keep this sort of skinny, weak, frail thing as the ideal? I think that's one archetype, but it doesn't seem like it's the ideal for everybody. Maybe for some, again, maybe certain Mulanas, maybe we need to switch to that mode. Maybe not everybody. Certain people, maybe they have to go through that, you know, bulking up, getting straight, you know, building up their strength. Maybe that's what they need to do. Somebody in their old age, like Habib, they show us that, look, even if you don't go through the typical physical body type, your spirit can overcome and generate the physical uh, strength that you need. Now, all of this, I think the main sort of crux here is this, the, that ideal, we're not in the physical presence of the imam for, for us to get those orders. At the very least, we know that there are, for those who have local ulama, they would know which things do we need to do for our local communities. Maybe, for example, because let's say a certain community is not doing well economically and financially. They know that there are many individuals who are struggling and striving. Now, let's say you're talking to a, per, a typical community member who's, you know, they're doing okay. They're middle class. So they can, you know, live paycheck to paycheck. They're okay. They're not suffering. They're not faqir. They're not in poverty but they're also not rich enough to kind of go out and donate constantly or help people in need. Like they're, they're, they're okay. But there's many community members that are not doing well. So for them, for example, maybe their local alim or sheikh or say whoever it is comes to, them, comes to them and says, look, maybe you need to adjust your diet too. This is something, again, very practical. When you adjust your diet, you let's say start intermittent fasting or actually Islamic fasting. Uh, you cut down the types of food that you have. So you're fuller, longer, whatever it is. You do X, Y, Z based on the advice of your local alim, then you're going to be saving whatever, 50 to 100 a month. That 50 to 100 euro, pound, dollars a month, now you can help out a certain family in need. And maybe that's the exact need for the community at that time. Now, maybe the community is not in financial need. Maybe there's something else. Maybe, for example, the community members, they are all doing well, but what they're spending their money on the, in terms of the physical food is they can only buy that sort of uh, Again, I'll use more of the American context because I don't understand the European context. It's things which are okay, but they're not, they're halal, but they're not tayyib. They're, they're, you know, it's legal, but maybe it's not really good for you. So maybe they're, you know, eating too much fast food uh, because they feel like it's cheaper. Uh, maybe they're not, you know, growing their own food or they're not, um, you know, cooking their own meals because of lack of time, whatever. There are other ways that simply taking care of these physical needs for people can help them out in the other sort of aspects of their life, right? Uh, most of us who are living in that fast paced life, those of us who have a traditional household where the, you know, the females who are undertaking the, you know, the majority of that work inside, they, they, you know, these things require a lot of work to make a nice wholesome meal for the family, you know, according to some narrations is the biggest jihad, right? Not just to, you know, uh, for a husband, for any of us to easily do to, to, you know, to call and order pizza or something like that. That's very easy. That's not creating a tayyib household for us. We should be able as um, the awliya, the, the walis, the heads of our households, be able to create a household where the best types of food are enjoyed by our, our children, by our spouses, by our family members, by everybody. And we should be encouraging that with our own type of physical behavior as well. So I hope that through all those kind of, you know, maybe disconnected points, hopefully the, the greater point was made, right, about there doesn't seem to be one specific physical archetype that we need to, an ideal form. There seems to be many ideal forms by both the Ahlul Bayt and the Ashab and the followers of the Ahlul Bayt. And it all seemed to have been, meaning the nucleus or the main focus was about what did their Imam need at that point. And I think if we can focus on what our local scholars need and what they uh, recommend us to do, then it'll give us a clearer picture about how we should practically uh, do Islah to our lives. And I'm glad the listener can hear that now because we don't want to exclude anyone from, um, from this type of reform. And if people have different types of bodies or different phase of life or different genders, this does not mean that there's an ideal which you are restricted from. Like you mentioned, so why look at Karbala, look at how many different types of people there were. And crucially, like you concluded, the aim was one thing. 
the aim was, what the imam wants, was you know, what is the will of Allah. Now, the external can take many different forms in pursuing that aim. But the actual purpose, which is consistent amongst all of them, is that this is what is expected of you by your imam. And sometimes we get so focused on the external, on, on how you look and, and all these things. And we fail to link that with, well, what is it for? What's the purpose of, of all of the work we're doing in this life, in our bodies, in our physical form? And the answer is, well, if it's Allah, جل, I don't get to look at you external and start telling you or judging you by an ideal figure that, that I don't know if, if, if you, know, you, are, you are meeting internally. I don't know if you are as strong internally as Amfal Abbas was, if you seem to have that physical appearance, of how he looks like in the pictures and in and, and, and the physical forms. Um, let's make this even more practical, uh, if we can, with you, Sheikh Nabil. So, if we link this, this discussion to self-development, where someone is listening now and wanting to become better and, and make practical improvements to their lives, often the ulama will give them practices and guidances which are based on your spirituality. Do this prayer regularly. It's good for Islam to learn or read Quran this much like it's part of you know, your, your, your life. And we start to build plans for ourselves or routines or to try and give us a sense of discipline that I'm going to do these targets and, and they're helpful for me in my journey. But it seems like in our discussion, we have to incorporate in our plans something physical as well. Like it can't just be pray this much. There needs to be some rules we make for ourselves. Or, well, I don't touch those foods or I don't eat this much amount or my body does not get into that state or that state. Like we make rules for ourselves. If someone's listening and thinking, I've heard this advice and I am going to go to my scholar and I'm going to ask them certain questions related to this development. My question is, why is it important that whatever plan we make for ourselves, we add the physical with the spiritual? Why is it important that in making discipline plans we from the beginning these things are present um in our in our development yeah i mean the thing is that you know, an individual has to have uh the in the same way that the the soul requires uh, a regime you know we have a physical regime as well uh, but there's also, there is a spiritual regime. And many a times we focus a lot on that spiritual regime. We don't really talk about, you know, that physical regime. There's a really good piece of advice from Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam, in his uh, letter to Imam al-Hassan, um, that uh, the Imam uh, says to him, says, if you do three things, you will never need a doctor in your life. Um and that is, the first thing is, eat only when you're hungry. Yeah. Second is, stop eating while you're still hungry. And then the third thing is that only go, uh, oh, before you go to sleep, only, uh, make sure that you empty your bowels. It says, if you do these three things, you will never need a doctor in your life. Now, all three of these, someone else comes to the sixth imam, you know, they bring a, uh, uh, an Indian doctor. And it was all the rage during the time of the sixth imam, you know, like the Hindi doctors or kind of like even right now, right? I guess some things never change. <laughs> it's the Indian doctor uh, that's come in Medina. And so like they've gone to Imam Asai and he's come with all his pomp and his glory. And he said, okay, what do you, you know, what do you say about, uh, you know, uh, physical well-being? And he says, I don't say anything. My grandfather Rasulullah said this. And he then gives him a very short narration about the stomach. The stomach is the mother of all the ailments of the body, everything. And this guy, the uh, Indian doctor, turns around and says, why have you brought me? When you have someone like this that has the most concise information about physical well-being, then why have you brought me? So that's one side of what we put in our bodies. Yes. Is it pure? Is it, you know... Um, can I keep my own animals? You know, at the very least, eggs. You know, in in England, it's very easy to keep chickens. Uh, uh, you know, you don't need special permits. In the US, it's a bit more difficult. But in England, you don't need permits. You know, you can go as high as like uh, a pygmy goat, I guess. And then after, when you start hitting sheep, then people start getting a bit iffy. Uh, but you know, just the chickens and quails and pheasants and things like that, you can keep them. Um, and and when you, you know, use the eggs to eat them, because you know they're pure, you're feeding them pure, you know, what you're then consuming from them is pure. And then when you eventually come to eat them, and, you know, people are like, oh, my God, I would never eat my own pet. Or, you know, like, we have this weird attachment. We'll happily go and buy it from the chicken shop. 
but raise our own, make it pure, slaughter it ourselves. No, 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 that's my pet. You know, <laughs> we're attached to the oddest of things, you know, when it comes to like this connection with um, food and stuff. So that that's the food side of it. The physical though, there has to be, and again, it's very personalized. Same with like the mustahabat, the wajibat are universal, like everyone, you have to do it, whether you like it or not, whether you're short, you're tall, you're fat, you're small, you know, whatever it is, you have to fulfill these. The mustahabat is like, okay, look, give yourself a regime. Same with the the, the physical uh, development, you know, of a person that um, they need to sort of try and make a regime for themselves, judging by their own body. I can't go, I've never run or I haven't run in six months and then decide to try and run as much as I can. I'm just gonna pass out. Uh, and so, yeah, I have to build myself up slowly. Uh, and the the ideal, I mean, you know, you get a bunch of these checks and balances, you get these home uh, blood test uh, things that they, you know, they send in to your home. Because in the UK, we, we don't really have very much preventative medicine. In the US, it's hugely preventative. Here, it's not really preventative. It's like when you're about to die, oh God, better take a blood test from you and figure out what's wrong with you. Ah, if we'd caught 10 years ago, you had a dodgy kidney, you might still make it. <laughs> you know, and so uh, prevention obviously is very good. And nowadays in the UK, you have to kind of pay for that now. Uh, so, the, but there's a load of different places where you send samples of your blood, they analyze it, they come back, they tell you what your cholesterol is, they tell you your, uh, you know, so when you look at that, and that's how you develop a program for yourself, right? Like I'm looking and, uh, you know, I'm saying, okay, look, I've got an issue with cholesterol, I've got this, I know I've got a family history, so I need to work on that, I need to develop myself. But at the whole, at the, the whole time that I'm doing this, my mind is focused on, I'm doing this qurbatan illallah, you know, because this is a, an amana from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, and then that physical activity that I partake in becomes a ibadat as well, because I've put God at the forefront of that action. Um, so, you know, so having a regime for yourself, even if it's like, look, two uh, half an hour sessions of walking a week, or, you know, like here in the, the center that I'm in, in Bradford, uh, during the, the winter when the Salat al-Fajr is more like six, seven o'clock, after Salat al-Fajr, there's a, a, uh, a Sunday hike that they go on for, for about three hours uh, into the Yorkshire moors and stuff like that. And everyone goes around and there's a group of seven, eight, nine uh, people that uh, have a hiking club. And so they go around and uh, do hikes and stuff like that. Um, every morning, so something like that can be incorporated into a community. Um, you know, even other things like, you know, you look at certain things where your know, gambling is haram, but yet there's only a, a few occasions when gambling is allowed. And one of those is horse riding. If you're actually the rider, archery, you know, if you're actually the archer, why is it that you can, you can place a bet on yourself? Why? It's because to improve that physical you know, ability that you have. It's to give you the better drive. Like, I want to be better because I want to win this money. Obviously, someone else standing there can't be putting <laughs> hedging bets on you. Like, oh, yeah, I've got him and I've got... No, it's you. It's to improve you as an individual. So competition, you know, actively working towards getting to a competitive level because it's driving you to be better. Uh, horse riding, sword fighting, archery, you know, uh, and you extend that on and, you know, you can extrapolate that to uh, martial arts and you can extrapolate that to swimming or whatever else. But all of it, you know, the Holy Prophet is saying, teach your children this, this incumbent that they know this, you go there, do this. Because not only is it honing a skill for an individual for a future where they may need it, uh, where they may be in a, in a situation, but at the same time, it's physically getting this body ready i mean you know, the holy prophet and the uh, and wrestling you know that uh, he would take part in you know so, yeah so it's all these things here where there's this, this massive physical aspect in the sunnah of the prophet that we have absolutely annihilated don't want anything to do with it physical or spiritual or moral you know the whole lot you know we've we've put it aside and we don't want to implement it 
But in the physical aspects uh, of the sunnah, uh, there's so much, you know, uh, to, to and it's not just, you know, okay, let's all get together and make a fake wrestling ring and start. No, no, actually go learn the art. You know, go and learn a martial art. Go and learn how to be a proper archer. Not just, I brought myself a, a competition bow off eBay and now I'm going to just start firing it randomly in the garden. Yeah, it goes some way, but find yourself a teacher. Learn how to fire the bow properly. You know, a, a horse riding. You know, all of these things. It's not just the fun of it. I mean, yes, that is a huge aspect as well that we don't link to religion. Well, you know, and that also leads to a bunch of our problems that, you know, the religious people are always so serious. The religious people are, don't know how to have fun. The relig- Why? Because we sort of don't think that fun should be part of the religion. Like we get really uptight. You know, here there's like we uh, there was one event that we did when I first joined the center was like we watched the football. And, uh, you know, as a way of bringing the youth back in and people were like, what? He's coming to the Imam Barga and letting them watch football. I don't care much about football. Everyone knows that. I, I, no, I don't have a clue about the sport. But the fact is that the ability for the, the aim was to get people together, to socialize. The football was never the aim. It was the socialization, the relaxing. You know, even Imam al and the various Imams that have about riwayat uh, about how you break your day down. And the, there's always a part in there for yourself, for your relaxation, for you know, for you to basically chill out, you know, uh, for you to see your friends, apart for God and apart for your family, you know. So that's how your day should be structured. But what we do is like sort of disassociate physical or uh, chilling, as it were, from being anything to do with ibadat or our journey towards Allah. Whereas they are absolutely essential for a person to be a sane, level-headed individual on this journey towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, it's true because like these de- we didn't mention these details before, but um, you know, horse riding and archery and all of those actions. The context now is obviously radically different to the context then. There's not like I'm gonna go to war now and I should know archery because well, I'm gonna they're gonna put me on the on the front line. It's not like that. But rather there's other things we derive from from those things. It's whether it's the discipline, whether it's the physical exertion, whether it's the community, there's other values which come from doing these deeds, or the fact that it is from the Sunnah and and Have you living seen the that new kind Rambo of- movie. No, I've not seen the new Rambo movie. <laughs> um, it's actually like really useful. <laughs> for those listeners who have seen Rambo, that was just for you. Um, <laughs> uh, but like, it means it means something different to me now. It means something different to me now. And yet there's still some value in, in making that path like my regime. But the point you mentioned, right, about people saying, well, why are we even doing these things? I think that comes from a larger mentality of these are dunyavi things. They're not really for religion. They are, you know enjoying yourself, going to the gym, like these things are making your body, focusing on your body in that way. These are for like this world and the mentality of this world. Whereas as we've been discussing, if there's one thing the listeners taking from the discussion, it's that if your mentality is for Allah Azza wa Jal, you're going to find yourself making physical adjustments in your life to get to that aim. Like, I think that's quite clear. But the mentality is still there that, no, these things are about improving my body and my jism and my dunya self and it's taking me away from God. Said Hassan, yeah. that view is wrong, right? Like, uh, did you want to add to that? Like, I want to say, why? Yeah, how do we change just, that mentality? It's something that just came to my mind that was also linked to what Said Hassan was saying is that traditionally the scholars that we have seen uh, have been slightly older uh, and have been, you know, not in the peak of physical health. Maybe they spent 10, 15, their prime years in the houses where they were fine. But now they've come here and, you know, they've come to the a new country. They don't know the gym rate that, you know, and then life catches up with them and then so does the waistline. But, you know, like, um, and, and Thorman said, Hassan will attest to this, like the Maraje, they have like these training regimes. And I'm talking like, these guys are 80, 90 years old, right? And I was so shocked when I found out about it. So they have these massive, like their training regimes are, look, they'll go on a walk. Like what can an 80, 90 year old body do, right? 
They'll go on a walk, but at the same time, they've got like these dynamic stretching routines that they do every morning. And can you imagine, like, you would never think of an of a manager, and you know, that image you've got in your head in the morning is, you know, out there doing the splits and, you know, touching his toes. And, but they have these dynamic stretches. And the reason they say that is like, it keeps them supple. It keeps them more youthful, as it were, for ibadat and all the day-to-day -day stuff they do. They're always going on walks. You know, they have a regime of doing walks. They have a stretching regime, all of these things. And, you know, it, we just don't associate that with something that a marja would do. I dare say, you know, you walk in to a, a, one of our own Indo-Pak centers or even an Arab and an Iranian center in the West. And, you know, said Hassan with his beautiful amama and everything. He starts, you know, someone walks in and he's like there, you know, stretching and, you know, having running on the spot. They're going to be like, what? What got into Maulana here, right? <laughs> but the thing is that these managers, you know, like they, your people are frowning. They'll be like, oh, you know what? Maulana's at the gym. You know, like it's something really weird. It's like when I first went to home and I was 18 years old and I went to study, the, the thing that amazed me was there was, there was a Molana on a motorbike. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, I've never seen a Molana on a motorbike. But you know, eventually a person grows up and is like, hey, okay, this is normal. But you know, when it comes to like physical and an alim, you know, being physically or doing something, I like. Nah, that's not the job of Mullah. He should be sitting on the musalla praying all the time. And then, you know, those that have graced the uh, manabir haven't really uh, been a great poster boy for physical strength uh, or focus on, you know, eating and stuff like that. So listen, you, you, you were just given a shout out, so why don't you respond to it? <laughs> um, I don't know if I'll ever be doing stretching inside of the center. <laughs> Uh, your camera's gone for a quick second, by the way. Just uh, apologies. Uh, if you could just yeah, adjust for a quick moment, yeah. Okay, let me start and stop. There you go, you're back, mashallah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's interesting because so at some of the local centers here, they've actually organized um, like ladies' uh, yoga classes and things like that. And I've seen some centers down the West trying to, uh, you know, start something physical. Now, I have my own views about yoga. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I would encourage that necessarily, but okay, whatever. It's a start. I get it. I don't have to be ideal, idealistic in the beginning. Um, going back to the, the original question you were talking about too, you know, and I'm sure Sheikh Nabil has gotten this question about, I'm sure people, when they come to you, they ask you the same thing. Like, oh, typical youth question, especially somebody who's younger. Oh, I can't wake up for Fajr. What do I do? And usually the answer is, oh, some, as traditionally was given is, oh, you know, ask the angels to wake you up before, you know, before you go to sleep, you know, make sure you do that. Recite all oh, this many times or do this, do this. So it's all like ibadat stuff. And I'm not discounting any of that. That's fine. But I'm like, look, if you just had like, you know, 200 grams of carbs, you know, right before you went to sleep, the only angel that's going to come pick you up is Malik al -Mot. Like, what do you think is going to happen? Like, this is not how this works. You can't just think that the, that that's how the relationship of the physical and spiritual works. And it, it's kind of sad, you know, people, now they're, you know, why are people reliant on, you know, alarms on their phones? Because their body, their body's natural clock, they're not getting enough REM sleep. All this stuff is out of whack. So they have to rely on outside things. Again, because we are in a lack of equilibrium where we don't have that balance, we're in a disbalance, we require something else to counterbalance it. And those things have their own issues, right? Having, um, again, depending on how conspir conspiratorial you are, keeping phones, radiation, all that stuff near, I know people keep it right near their head as they're sleeping. like. Uh, I mean, almost by any account, even if you don't believe in the whole radio wave or radiation stuff, just a heated device like that next to your head is a terrible idea regardless. But so we are now using all this technology and all these things to counterbalance things that we could probably handle on our own if we just stuck to the proper physical um, uh, regimen, right, and regime. So even for the fudger thing, yeah, if a person's only eating properly, as Sheikh Nabil was alluding to as well, right, keeping to the, you know, simple meals, uh, simple amounts of food, just as much as they need, keeping hungry, then even something like fudge wouldn't be a big deal. A lot of us wouldn't be struggling. And I notice this myself when I eat really late, you can feel how much tougher it is to get up for fudger. Now, I guess unless you're like you're an Adif like Nabil or a Boston, maybe it's a little different, right? But a lot of us were struggling just to get up for fudger, right? And I know I'm like, okay, if I actually stop at like five, six, maybe max 7 p.m. and then wake up, I feel so much better, right? And even when I have my, uh, I have to have my morning cup of coffee soon, but when I do have that morning cup, sometimes I'll have it 
and it ends up being making up for the fact that I, I mess up my evening. I'm like, oh, I need that coffee to wake up. And sometimes it's like, you know what? I can't wait to get a start on the day. I want an extra boost now. And that coffee feels, you know, so much different. So I like how there's no versions, but there's no coffee. Like in both versions, you need the coffee. They just mean different things. <laughs> well, I mean, even if I'm intermittent fasting, technically I can still, I mean, uh, Islamic fasting is different, right? Yeah. But no, because Islamic fasting, I don't have it for, for Sadi. Uh, but for, yeah, I'm not the type that does the caffeine in the morning. I think it's a terrible idea. Uh, even at night, I usually, in Ramadan, pretty much there's no caffeine at all. Unless Same. it's one of those, you know, you know, the late night sessions, then you have no choice sometimes. But, um, but otherwise, yeah, I usually cut out caffeine for, for those 29, 30 days. But yeah, I mean, I, I enjoy the taste. It's got benefits. Even intermittent fasting, if I, you know, don't add any creamers or um, pretty much anything else, just keep it black coffee. Uh, maybe I'll just add like some salt or maybe some cinnamon. That's it. And usually, you know, just a you know, key, uh, what's the, keep me, uh, keep me going, I guess, basically. Um, okay. Yeah. Where, I don't know how I ended up at coffee <laughs> at this point, but, uh, yeah. So you were asking before then about the, so, uh, yeah. So about the ulama giving advice. So it would be nice. I mean, ulama thinking about physical advice, like, you know, so when this kid is asking you about food stuff, uh, about fudge, like, look, what are you eating before you go to sleep? Are you yeah. eating before you go to sleep? What time? I was just saying, are you going to the bathroom before you go to sleep? That's necessary because if you don't, very simply, you're, you might wake up in the middle of the night. If you do that, you have interrupted sleep. That's going to mess you up when you try to wake up for, for Fajr a little bit later on, right? Uh, sleep amount as well. That's a physical thing. The amount that you sleep, which of course is related to how much you eat. As Sheikh Nabi was talking about, these ulama, the reason that we hear these famous things, oh, Ayatollah Bahjad did this, and Imam Khomeini slept like this, and Sayyid Fadullah did this. They were sleeping three, four, five hours a day max to spread throughout the day. Why? Because they had barely anything to eat. And when they did have food, they had the proper amounts of food. As they said, they kept their gut biome in check with the you know, proper types of food. It wasn't just garbage, trash food that you and I might be eating. It wasn't ter- you know, bad sleep, you know, sleeping late at night and trying to stay up till Fajr, which are terrible. This is a terrible spiritual practice, right? Especially for youth. You know, I thought Makaram Shirazi, I think, addresses this as well, that youth should not be staying up all night just to pray Fajr and go to sleep. Like that's destroying um, you know, our, our body's internal clock. So these are all physical things. Yes, of course, it's all spiritual, but we're talking in a very physical sense right now. The amount that you sleep, the amount that you eat, physical activity or lack thereof, all of these things will act as a vehicle or a tool to help your spiritual growth in that sense. So if your alim is not describing that or mentioning these things, then you should say, look, I, maybe they slipped their mind. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt, right? Some personal fun. Maybe they forgot to. But now that you're listening to this, thanks to, thanks to Abbas for setting something like this up, you can tell your local alim and sheikh, monana, whatever, that look, your spiritual teacher, whoever it is, hey, I, I need to make sure my spiritual regimen is good too. Can you help me with that? Right? Just you, you go out and be proactive if they're not coming out and doing it on their own. And for all those maybe tulab and students and ulama listening, you know, first, you need to get your physical stuff in check too. I'm not saying you have to do keto. You want to do paleo, fine. You want to do some whole food plant-based diet for a little while. I mean, don't go vegan. We got no vegan stuff in Islam, right? That's, that's very important. No such thing as vegan. Um, you got to make sure you have your meat. You know, that's the only, it's a proper source of protein that you can't, you know, get these certain vitamins and minerals anywhere else. But, you know, we have to make sure that we are uh, acting as the proper role models as well in terms of physical activity. Um, and then we can advise people accordingly. I mean, you know, we have to start with these things before we start jumping to jump to a mental health counselor. You no, know, maybe they just need to change their diet. Maybe that'll be enough for them to kind of help things out, right? Especially when you think about the benefits of dark chocolate, not with sugar added, but you know, simple things they say, you know, a little bit of dark chocolate helps with serotonin and dopamine. You know, who knows? Like, I'm not saying, look, I'm not a mental health counselor. I'm not saying have some chocolate and that's going to get rid of your stress and anxiety, but I don't know, sometimes it might help out, but yeah, watch your sugars, obviously. Um, the other question I think you were talking about, t- talking about uh, Abbas before was about people and their disconnection of jism and yeah, so jism body or lower world and then the, the higher physical planes. So Again, because I don't want to take up too much time. So I'll also explain it in terms of the way that most philosophers will explain it right now. Most metaphysicians that look, as we said before, we are pure, immat- we are purely immaterial. The soul is immaterial. Nobody will deny that. Well, you might have a few, but whatever. We are immaterial. As we lower ourselves down, the soul requires something to help it along its way. It needs that vehicle, as we said. So in Barzakh, it required something, and that was a body that was created. So the clear example is in a dream. You can taste, you can touch, you can smell, you can you know, hear, you can do all those, but that's not through the physical. That's a specific kind of body that your soul has generated to interact on that plane of existence. Likewise, when the soul then descends to the lowest one, a dunya, the lowest place, which is this physical realm, it created and generated another body. 
This is a body that our soul has generated. And every single moment, according to, again, the majority of our metaphysicians, that's what our soul is doing, is that it's taking in some physical stuff and then re regenerating a body every moment by moment, every single moment. So when we're eating trash, we're going to be generating a trashy body, and that's going to affect our spirituality. So people who say, oh, forget about the dunya, uh, these physical things don't matter. Well, as Sheikh Nabi was saying, Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the Ahlul Bayt, they were involved in horse riding. They were the best of horse riders. They were the best on the battlefield uh, in terms of their sword. I mean, they, they trained for these things too. How many of us are sitting there listening to the Masaib of the Ahlul Bayt? Imam Hussein and Hadith Abbas are training these little kids on how to fight, right? Right before Aun and Muhammad, for example, or Qasim or whatever, when they're going out to the battlefield, they're saying, hey, this is how you do a flank, you know, this is how you flank somebody. If they're coming this way, this is what you do. They're describing them physical things. Now, these are, of course, it's a link to the metaphysical, but these are physical instructions that they're giving them here, right? So for ourselves as well, yes, when this, uh, we know that it's very touchy to talk about the physical sort of war element of Islam, which I think that's, that's a problem that we have to filter so much. But in almost every single society or civilization, you see that they, the, the people who are defending freedoms or defending your country or whatever, they're, when you see them, you don't think of somebody frail or somebody huge. You think of somebody in physically fit condition, right? Whether they're part of the army or whatever it happens to be, or a police force or local force, right? And sometimes the trope is, of course, well, at least in America, that they don't, they're not the most physically fit. But the idea is if they have that physical fitness in mind, then they're able to stand up for their principles and what matters to them. Meaning for us, it's the metaphysical. So we, we need that stuff as well. If the physical didn't matter, you wouldn't see this in the narrations talked about so much. Sheikh Nabil has already mentioned a bunch of uh, riwayat, which are very important, right? Again, I'm not talking about the medicinal ones because those are controversial, right? There, there's a debate about those. But just generally speaking, he talked about how the imams have mentioned. It's, it's you know, the gut, the, the stomach, which is a very clear thing. Whether you take it literally, meaning it's the, the kind of food that we have or the amount of food, or some take it deeper that, no, it's the, the type of food that can affect your gut biome that has an effect on everything else, which... Again, people who are into nutrition, I know Sheikh Nabil is as well. We talk about inflammation or the issues in your gut flora, gut biome. Like a lot of us, because of the stuff we eat, it affects the rest of our mind. Many nutritionists right now are saying there's a clear connection between your gut and your, your neurology, right? That's why they're saying if you have highly inflammatory foods, uh, foods high in omega-6s, for example, these, these oils that are inflammatory, like vegetable oil, canola, all this stuff, these things are affecting your, your mind as well. And then when we say mind, we're talking about, you know, the physical brain itself. But of course, from our perspective, we're talking about the soul, which has generated and created this mind and created the rest of the body. So all of these things are there. So I would say to those individuals who are denying that sort of connection that, look, you are denying a clear thing mentioned in the, uh, in the Quran. Uh, very simply, you look at the story of Nabi Adam and Bibi Hawa alayhi wasalam. What caused their habut and descent? It was food. It was them eating something. Right? Yeah, they're told not to approach the tree, but by all accounts, it's them eating. Now, some say it was an apple, some say it was grape, some say it was wheat, doesn't matter what the actual thing was. S something being consumed had led to their dissension and them degenerating to a different plane of existence. Or if you take the traditional Kalami answer that they left that garden or that uh, paradise and they go down. This is the first story that you and I are becoming familiar with about humans. The first humans, they lose their spot in heaven or garden or whatever you wanna uh, describe it as because of what they ate, very simply. Now, again, there's metaphysical descriptions of that. I don't wanna get into that because again, that'll take us to another session, but it's food that's mentioned. And a lot of different stories about um, other anbiya. Again, we're coming to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He's talking about the food that's, that's in their bellies as well. The Ahlul Bayt are talking about, you know, are you eating haram? As Sheikh Nabil talked about, is the halal food that you might be buying, is it from a halal income itself? Uh, you know, is your niyat when you're going and working, is that halal too? There's so many repercussions to the physical. I mean, I don't know how a person can deny the connection when we, we clearly recognize that we are metaphysical, immaterial beings. We are put on this plane so that we can achieve that akhirah, that akhirah that we are building right now is based on what we're doing here, uh, right now, right? As Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam famously uh, is attributed to have said, dunya mazra'atul akhirah, right? This is the, the farm, this is the garden. We're planting everything here. This is a physical planting. We do all this stuff and we, we harvest it over, over there. Although, again, as the uh, ulama say, it's happening right now, but because of our ghafla, we're not, you know, we're not cognizant of that. And it's funny because the physical analogy, the food analogy makes sense. A lot of us have terrible physical regimes and, and, and regimens, whether it's the actual food we eat or lack of exercise, um, lack of sleep, whatever it is. 
and we don't connect it to the actual issues that we're facing in our life. The physical stuff, we don't connect that. It's causing me these mental issues or these spiritual issues. We don't make that connection all of a sudden. And maybe because all that food is giving us and helping us or contributing to that ghafla, uh, as it seems to have been done by, uh, as we see has, has been mentioned by the Ahlul Bayt, alayhi wa salam. And I'm glad of how many examples we have for someone listening to try and pursue one of these many, many threads which could bring them progress. Um, yeah, there's a lot of very beautiful points there, mashallah. We have come to the end of the of the time for the recording, but I wanted to go back to you, Sheikh Nabil, just for last word on this. Um, for the person listening who, I mean, we're in Muharram now. So some of these things we can do now, like the way we regulate our food in the majalis, but most of these things are long lasting regimes. Like you said, we have to set. What advice do you give? What advice do you give to the person who wants to implement these things in their daily life? What, what are your practical tips to them in leaving the month uh, of Azhar to carry this on? It's quite simple, um, and that is a step at a time. What we tend to do is go from a, uh, go from zero to a hundred, spiritually, physically, whatever it is, because we, the society we live in, the way that we've been brought up, it's all about instant gratification. But the thing is that these both spiritual and physical growth, uh, or reduction physically whatever however whatever your aim is it, it doesn't happen overnight it has to be a lifestyle change and when you change lifestyle your nafs will fight it it will try and find some way some how to you know the nafs is the, really uh, the whole podcast just on the deception of the nafs in itself you know like that animalistic lazy side that exists within you how how it deceives you and you don't even realize the spiritual defects that it creates from why you choose to uh, lean against the wall in a gathering while others are not you know why why you choose to sit on a chair why all of that, if you really analyze it and go deep, 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 you can find some sort of nafsi issue that is tied down to that uh, nafs of a person. But the nafs naturally is, is lazy. You know, it's not inherently bad. It's just, in, it's an animal. You know, the same way a lion goes after the weakest, you know, uh, a wildebeest, you know, it, it looks and says, okay, well, not the one that's the fittest and the fastest, but this one that's slightly lame and slightly podgier than the rest, easier to catch, least amount of effort. The nafs, least amount of effort it wants to exert, right? And that's why sin is always easier than ubudiyah, because it's the least amount of effort. And so your nafs is naturally inclined that way. Anyway, so when you go and try and change this nafs, try and change its mindset, as it were, that, you know, you want to put it under physical strain through, you know, uh, exercise or through on, uh, in spiritual uh, strain through ibadat, it will always try and find some sort of a way out of it. So in the same way that you train an animal, you have to learn to train your nafs in that way. You know, like you have like the cat whisperer and the dog whisperer and all these. So you got to be a nafs whisperer. <laughs> Understand your nafs, like where it is that you're you're working on and try and see how you can do it. And the only way to do it is to almost trick it, to set up a, a, a system of uh, checks and balances and rewarding yourself. So, you know, when they talk about cheat days, in a, you know, in a training regime. That's because, you know, you're nuffs. If you go on all out war with it, you're not going to win because it will, it will break you in some way, shape or form. So you have to sort of make almost a, a, a pact with it, as it were, um, and slowly develop yourself stage by stage. Don't go zero to hundred, write it down. Okay, look, this, the next two weeks, I'm not going to have sugar. I'm going to cut it out. And I'm going to see what it does for me. Yeah. After two weeks, then I add something else. Okay, look, I've got to cut down on the fast food that I'm eating. After two weeks, you know, maybe I need to tackle those fizzy drinks, you know. And so I do it in stages and stages and stages and say, okay, look, now I can introduce sugar after eight weeks, but I was having two teaspoons. I'm only going to go to one teaspoon now and I won't let it increase. Uh, and so I build myself like that. Uh, you know, I can't train five days a week, can't train six days, whatever it is. So I say, okay, look, at the very least, two days in the week, I'm going to find half an hour for the next month. 
that I'm just going to either go on a walk or I'm going to do something physical, even if it's running up and down my stairs for the 20 minutes or high intensity 15 minute workout is equivalent to an hour's, you know, slow burning workout. You know, you're there, you do a five minute intense, you know, follow it on YouTube, do whatever it's in your living room, you know, do that, do the M100s, whatever it is, raise your meta, uh, you know, your metabolic rate so that you're, you're burning. Whatever it is, find something, but start slow and start small. Reforming the body is just as important as reforming the soul and the immaterial. And as we have seen, they are things which operate together. When we're building our own plans for self-development and our regimes for growth and reformation, these things need to be integrated with one another. What I'm eating and who I'm praying to should come to the same the same effort, which is you know worshipping Allah Azza wa and serving Him in the way that we have been created to serve. And we see in Abba Abdullah so many examples of the link between this physical and this non-physical. We saw so many examples in, in that podcast. Um, you know, especially when he's saying to the people that the reason why you're not listening to me is because of the sin you have consumed into your stomachs. How clear is that proof that their physical actions, how they treated their body, had an effect on their spiritual decision making? Or for example, the companions the companions of different ages, all of them striving hard and different bodies striving hard for the sake of Abba Abdullah. And the example of Abba Abbas is perhaps the greatest example of the companions of a man who had both worked hard to become the form required to defend Ahl al-Bayt. But like Sayyid so beautifully mentioned, it wasn't just that. It was the spiritual warfare he executed internally, which showed us his value and his worth, or at least a glimpse of it. Maybe we'll spend an entire eternity to try and um, see more of it and keep learning of the greatness of that man and the rest of, of Ahl al-Bayt uh, as well. And so I hope as we continue in our series on reform and you tune in tomorrow, we can keep building on this idea of reforming the individual and reforming the community. Inshallah.